Hello, everybody. I hope you're well. In this episode of the We Love Cycling video podcast, I talk to Chef Hannah Grant, who happens to be a good friend of mine. Now, she talks about her experience working as a chef, um, starting out in the Royal Navy in Denmark, and then in 2011, moving in to work with cycling teams and how nutrition and sport has changed over the last decade or so. I do hope you enjoy the chat. It's in progress. It's in progress. We are recording. Uh, Hannah, thank you very much uh, indeed for joining me. Um, we were saying a few moments ago, the last time we actually met might have been around 2016, might not it? So it's yeah. been ages. But it does feel as if it hasn't been that long because you're, right. you're such fun to hang around with. And we've we've had some good nights out, haven't we, and some good times over the years. <laughs> definitely, definitely, yeah. It's we've had been, some fun. Uh, Good times. <laughs> Definitely. Well, Hannah, for people who are intrigued about your background and maybe don't know uh, too much about you, can you take us right back to the start? So obviously you're, you're, you're you know, a very successful chef, writer, broadcaster, but take us back to when it all started, just to give us a sense of where you've come from. So how did, how did this culinary journey uh, start for you? Mm, so um I grew up uh, I grew up in Copenhagen in Denmark with uh, with the creative parents my dad was an actor and my mom was a dancer but uh, similar for both of them they had uh, restaurant uh, restaurateur parents so right. I grew up in a in a home with uh, lots of uh, lots of crazy food I think that that's you know in the 80s um <laughs> seasoning anything with the with lemon cyst would be like are you insane and my my dad would make all these crazy things uh, now it would be standard normal healthy things but back then it was sort of it would seem like you know absurd things to do so i was sort of brought up in a kitchen at home where you know experimenting with things playing around with flavors was completely normal right and i always had you know my hands in in food and my dad taught me to to make the basics even like from you know um six seven years old i would uh, you know make a, a spaghetti bolognese and um, i knew how to make a bechamel sauce and it was just like i was kind of like taught um food from an early age so it was always in me loving to, to cook and experiment and um as i grew up I, I sort of knew that you know i wanted to do something creative um yet i had this passion for food so that that sort of like melted together being able to to cook and then also have the creative part of it where I could experiment and not necessarily, you know, follow rules or recipes, uh, um, but sort of like come up with my own stuff. And then at the same time, I had uh, an abundance of uh, energy. I was not very good at sitting still in school. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I had a super focus for things I was interested in and not so much uh, any interest within things that was like, nah, you know. So I think nowadays you'd probably categorize it as like an ADHD sort of thing. Um, but nevertheless, that sort of like was, um, that was like my core um, energy and, and that did fit quite well into like the restaurant industry. So um well, when I was 20, um, I, uh, <laughs> I joined the Navy, the Royal Danish Navy in Denmark, um, because I was sort of like I'd actually dropped out of high school and um, it didn't work out for me. And my mom was like frustrated. You're never going to become anything. Um, and sort of like to give myself sort of like a disciplinary kick in the behind, I thought, hmm, I'm going to sign up for the Royal Danish Navy, just like all the guys in Denmark. They they have to do it. I signed up myself. And um, when I joined the Navy, I met uh, a now very good friend of mine who was chef. And um, I was on an inspection ship sailing around uh, Greenland and Iceland and the Faroe Islands uh, doing fishery inspection. Wow. Um, yeah, it was crazy. Um, so we would like check out fishing boats to see if they had too much uh, or if they were catching the right fish and so on and so on. And uh, in the middle of the uh, <laughs> uh, Arctic Sea, um, I would stand in the galley with my friend helping him out. And I remember like uh, he said, you can see some the bechamel sauce. And it was obviously not a tiny pot. It was like a, you know, 50 liter 
like stirring with a paddle <laughs> kind of uh, sauce. And he's like, you season it and finish that one up. And I'm like, okay. And it's like heaps of like salt and spices in and nothing tasted of anything. And it sort of like dawned on me. I'm like, I'm going to be a chef. You know, it was so unromantic. It was like, so, you know, you, it's not like, ooh, delicious little things. It was like absurd amounts of sauce. And I was like, this is my calling. This that's, is what I'm going to do. It's very interesting. So <laughs> it's quite, uh, yeah. so rather than go into it and, and want to become, a, you, there was a moment, almost like a, one of those epiphanies where you realize that you're going to, you're going to be doing something. That, that's amazing. That happened out in the Arctic Sea. That, 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 that's amazing. It, it was, it was, you know, I always had the interest and, and as a 14, 15 year old, when I finished my uh, grade school, um, I actually wanted to start at the, the hotel and restaurant school in Copenhagen. And my mom was like, not going to happen, you know. You're too young. Everybody's an alcoholic in that business. Uh, that's not going to happen. We're not going to allow that. So I was like, mm -mm, okay. I went to high school and then, you know, it sort of like took the next five, six years to be like, wait a minute. This was what I really wanted to do. So I came back from, uh, you know, serving my time in the Danish Royal Navy, like the head on and everything. Um, and, uh, and started culinary school um, back in 2003. Did four years of training um, and graduated in 2007, um, where I went. I was going to be a Michelin star chef, clearly. That was my plan, you know. I was going to aim for the stars. Um, so I went to uh, went to England in uh, Bray, uh, outside of Maidenhead, where Heston Blumenthal had his fat dog restaurant, which back then was, you know, it was like the, the peak of molecular gastronomy. So the idea of, like, food looking like, one thing, but being something else. It would look like an apple, but then it was, you know, tuna fish, or it would sure, look like sure, a pea. Yeah. And there is. So that sort of thing. I was very, you know, wowed by that. Um, and I did a stage there, which meant basically uh, working for free to get experience to get into other restaurants. Um, and uh, that was sort of like an interesting uh, turn on things. I realized that that was definitely not the way it was going <laughs> to go around things. Um and at the same time, um, for me, it was clear that food had to have, you know, another dimension. Food wasn't just beautiful and great tasting. To me, I liked the fact that food could do something else. You know, it could bring energy. It could uh, help you so, perform and so on. So, so, so that was. So is this, is this, sorry, was this, is this where then? Because I was going to ask that, that, that fundamental qu that the question, because this is obviously a lot of cyclists are watching this. At what point then did you land in the cycling world? Because that's how we've we we met. We met out. I think it was probably the 2013 Giro or something like that when we first met. I can't remember exactly when I was back in my GCN days. It certainly was my GCN days because yeah, we've done several videos together, cookery videos back in the day. We, we, we did so one, young. <laughs> we did we did one with Sean Kelly at Paris Roubaix. Didn't we? You, you made yeah. a, a, a meal which which it, people can watch. That's still online. So uh, they're still on YouTube, but. So Hannah, tell me about the site that you, your first involvement with cycling and 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 how that happened and how that ultimately evolved. Because you're still, although you're 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 now you're, you're more out of the cycling world a bit, you're still heavily involved because you've got some new yeah, you know, got a new book coming out very very shortly. But yeah, yeah, tell us about the cycling element. So um, I was uh, in 2010. I was working uh, at uh, restaurant Noma in Copenhagen and. Um, uh, you know, Michelin star, everything. It was, it was sort of like where I had the, the true epiphany of like, okay, if at this time I was 26 years old um, and I, I came to, you know, it's sort of like being a chef is sort of like being an athlete. You, your body is, you use your body so much, except being a chef, you're not told to, at least not back then, train and be careful with your body. So you actually won't break it. Um, but it was clear to me that I had to find a way out of the 18 hour kitchens into something that could be a more long-term solution for me. And, uh, I started asking around, you know, I was going to go to university and study, uh, food science and nutrition. Um, and then all of a sudden, uh, this crazy opportunity showed up, uh, which was, um, do you want to do one season for a cycling team as a chef? following them, you know, at all the major races. And, um, <laughs> and I thought, this is crazy. I mean, I, I had, it was 
my colleague back then at Noma was the guy who had the contact. Um, so he was friends with one of the body therapists and they were looking for a chef. And um, I had previously worked on a kiteboarding expedition boat. So I had some knowledge on athletes and fueling. Um, obviously nothing. Uh, I mean, I knew bas- now I know that I knew nothing when I came into cycling. Um, but I was offered to sort of like do this one season before uh, another chef that they had planned was going to start uh, working for them. Um, and so I, in 2010, uh, agreed to, to to take the job. Um, and uh, I was sort of like told that it was going to be, you know, um, maybe six days of work, then you're home a week, 10 days, then back maybe four or five days, and then you're home. So, you know, it's 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 a pretty simple job. I was going to study uh, on the side, get my math and chemistry classes so I could get into uni. Um, and I thought, okay, this is great. I get to travel. I get to do the nutrition. And so I started in January 2011 at a training camp in Mallorca with 29 riders um, at a hotel where I had to alone, one chef, cook three meals a day for 29 riders, which I don't think is any secret, eats like 80 people probably, right? This was like mission impossible. What was the, t- what is, was, it, was it Tinkoff straight away? Was it the Tinkoff or was it a different team? What was the team? Back, back then, well, it was the same team, but back then it was called the Saxobank Sungard. Of course, yeah, um, it was a C- the, so, the, the, off the back of the CSC team, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so the t- the team changed names. Uh, I was with the team uh, full time for five years, and uh, the team changed names five times, <laughs> once in a year, twice. Um, so you know, I started off, and it was uh, two weeks in Mallorca, and I mean, I was after three days, I was dead. I was done, yes. and I was like the riders. The, you know, I'd had so many talks <clears throat> with the, the team owner and nutritionist and some of the more, you know, nutrition interested writers, uh, Chris Anger, the late um, uh, colleague of mine, to sort of like know, you know, timing, what, is, what does it take? What do they need? What do I do? You know, um, and back then in 11, it was a new thing to sort of like try and uh, set the t- a different tone for a team. We wanted more vegetables, more whole foods, uh, everything cooked from scratch, less sugars when you were not on the bike. Um, basically anything that nowadays is totally normal. But back then it was like, what? Like, <laughs> like all the riders would look at me and they were like, you are the spawn of Satan. You're taking away my ketchup. <laughs> I can't have my white pasta. Like, like what's going on? Right. It was like rebellious. Um, so my first year with the team was, it, it was really, really tough. And I got a lot of pushback from the riders, which wow. back then was, you know, <clears throat> the, the old school, legendary top of top of the pop riders. Um, so Col- Alberto Constal would have been with you at that time, wouldn't yes, he? Yes. Yeah, for example. This was, yeah. He had just come to the team and uh, there was obviously, this was also a thing I realized after, which was, you know, there's not only was there a generational uh, gap between the riders and differences? You also had, you know, the culture backgrounds, you know, in terms of what would they eat? What were they used to? What did they grow up with? All these things. And at a race trying to, to make eight or nine riders happy is difficult enough as it seems, but 29 different guys, you know, being like, mm, you know, they were like not having it. Wow. So wow. It, it was, you know, I think actually, if you if you if you ask any guys that was on that training camp, I don't think any of them would have thought that I would have stayed for five years within uh, that team. But you know, for me, it became it became a thing I had to conquer. Right for every race, Paris Nice was my first race ever. I had just got my driver's license because I had to have a driver's license, and they gave me this Volkswagen van, and they were like, "Here you go." You know, we're in Paris and we see you in Nice, basically. Here's the keys. Here's a credit card. Da, da, da. And I knew wow. nothing about, I mean, it was just, it was. So you had to learn. You had to learn very, very quickly, didn't you? Didn't you? Oh, and, and my God. And that will die. It, yeah. Um, so how did, so to, to briefly, it just in, in essence, how did you end up? fueling the riders correctly was this something that evolved over time did you work in clearly though as you've illustrated there was kickback from the riders yeah but did you work with the coaches in in terms of their 
their nutritional demands, their the calorific demands uh, first first and foremost as well. How did you know what to feed them, and and how did that evolve over the years until the riders? Because I, I I remember bumping into you on, on a number of occasions. Most of the time, you were wearing sunglasses because you wanted to go to sleep because you were tired all the time. <laughs> I remember that, but you're always very, you'd always, you'd always, you're always very, you always make us a coffee and you would always give us something that to try, which was always, as one of my favorite things was coming to see you at the kitchen truck, but just tell me how you're in with food. Exactly. (laughs) How did you evolve this? And and at what point did the riders start to think, ah, okay, this is working. Uh, Explain how you worked to get the nutrition plan. Well, I think my first, uh, my first sort of like uh, clash with, with the, the whole cycling universe was I was under the understanding that when you as a pro rider had signed a contract with the team, it was your interest as well as the team interest to follow the nutritional guidelines of the team. I thought, well, these are pro guys. Of course, they're going to follow what the team says. I hadn't put into to, you know consideration that this was not the case. So basically I was left with, you know, I, I had this sort of, uh, like the list of guidelines. I mean, even I'm, I'm going to just uh, do relentless self-promotion here. My, my grant to a cookbook that I published in Danish in 13 and in English in 15. Yeah. Um, in, in that one, they're sort of like the original list of the sort of like the guidelines we were working after. Okay. And, and uh, for me to see, you know, the, the perfect guidelines, here's the perfect diet that you need to eat as a rider to be the best. It's here. And then I realized, well, if the riders come from uh, what you call a standard hotel buffet or a shitty hotel buffet, which is here, which is overcooked pasta, rice, ketchup, maybe French fries, cakes, abundance of cakes, whatever, deep fried stuff. And they're used to being able to take this. They're not going to go over here and, and straight take away. What's yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, sure. It, it, this is impossible. The, 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 you know, the change is too big. You can't change this at once. So slowly I realized, okay, well, if I got, I got to open this up and, and, you know, these two worlds had to like meet at some point. So I, it was sort of like playing around, figuring out when do I hit the spot for having the correct ingredients that, you know, the team wants. And that is like the whole foods, nutritional kind of healthy stuff that is good for them in terms of recovery and, and, and performance. Like when does that spot hit with, the riders being, mm, I want to eat that and, sure. and enjoying it. Sure. So then at a certain point, um, I, f- I feel like we're in, it's it, it's early starts in, in the Giro 11. Um, we had a rider who was uh, ha- couldn't eat any dairy or any uh, gluten. So I made, you know, lots of foods. I, I tried to make it so that the, he wouldn't notice that he got something different. And sure. I did that by creating food for everyone so they could all eat it and nobody... You know, it was like, everybody eats the same and here's pasta. And he just knew, you know, don't eat the pasta. Sure. So then this way he lost a lot of weight and it was like, you know, and he was a very young rider back then. And, um, and all of a sudden you see a change when somebody notices a change, he felt better. You know, there was a lot of things that, that changed for him. Some of the older riders are like, wait a minute, what's going on here. Right. And then they start to see, okay, there is something about back then they were like, well, this is just fuel. There's nothing else for this. They can't change anything else. Um, and then this happened. And then that sort of opened the door to a very slow progression on, okay, they would try. I mean, honestly, it was like demonstratively in the beginning, they would just go to the hotel buffet, go past my food. And basically wow. it felt like this, right? Oh, I can't do it, but... <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Please blur it out. Right. It felt like flipping a bird, but you know, they would just go and they would look at me like, they might like take the stuff they couldn't have wow um and and it was painful right i was like i mean so many people on the planet would love to have that food all the other riders and all the other teams were like long eyes like oh my god and they were like you know no so once i sort of hit that spot and we 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 found this works this doesn't and i i constantly was trying to talk to the riders that was keeping an open mind to me um and trying to understand also understand the background and and because i didn't i mean when i started met i didn't even know i didn't even know the colors of the jerseys in the tour de france (laughs) and the sports directors would sit at the dinner table at night once i had fed the riders i would sit with them and the joke of the night would be asking me questions about cycling so they could just laugh their asses off because they didn't know you know it was like full-on ha ha you know 
absurd. So I, I was like trying to like start and like read up on all of this at the same time, trying to figure out what the sweet point was trying to fit in as a female, also getting a lot of pushback from the old male staff yeah. on that as well. It, it, I mean, I had a staff member come up and tell me you don't belong here. I'm like, what the That's cr- it's, 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 it's crazy, isn't it? It's absolutely it, crazy. It, yeah, It's absurd. And I said to him, my gender doesn't define whether I'm good at cooking or not. And he was like, it was like, you're not going to last anyway. But so slowly, you know, when I hit that spot of like what they wanted to eat to what they had to eat, we were in the middle. And then when they were in here, I could sort of like slowly push it. That became ingredients that was like back then quinoa. They would be like, oh, what's this? It's weird. And then that would be a, that would be on the OK list all of a sudden. And then you could mix that. I had a, I had a two to one ratio. I, I would use two ingredients that they loved with one that was sort of new. Okay. Um, and then never, never mix it up so much that they couldn't see what was in it, uh, because it was like I had to gain trust all the time. Yeah. So you're uh, educating them and gaining, trying to gain trust. Yeah, yeah, sure. Constantly. So, so, so the ratio of two things they really wanted it with one that was new, and they would be like, ah, fuck it, I can't, I don't want to sit and spit this out, so I'll just try it. And they're like, oh, this is good. And then you had another ingredient on the green list, basically. So this was sort of like how how it it, it was in the beginning, and then, um. In in eleven, I also with the Giro, it became very clear to me that I was going to physically die being alone in the team. We had a kitchen truck, you know. You can't. I mean, as a chef at a team, there's logistics. You have to drive, uh, figure out your roads uh, around Italy and around the race and everything. You have to shop. Yep. You have to set up. You have to cook. You have to clean, and you also have to nurse them. So it's like it's, it's enormous. It's, it's an, it's an enormous job, you yeah. know, and um, and I just couldn't, I mean, you also have to sleep yourself at some point. That's, you know, some glasses. Um, but so I managed to get an assistant. And after the season uh, 2011, uh, I actually, the team asked me, you know, the guy that was supposed to take over, he's, he's, he doesn't want to do it anyway. Do you want to continue? And I'm like, okay, well, but if I continue, things I need, need to change. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And okay. so I, I managed to uh, get the team approved in the Danish hotel and restaurant school uh, system as a restaurant so I could have apprentices. Ah, so they, okay. It, so, yeah. So in Denmark, like an apprentice, chef apprentice, it's four years. And the rule was because I didn't have an a la carte restaurant, I could have chef apprentices the last two years of their education. Uh, and obviously, I mean, imagine this dream finishing your education, traveling around Europe, you're in Italy, fresh cheese, charcuterie, France, Spain, you see where everything's from. So this was obviously ama- amazing. And uh, so I, I graduated uh, three apprentices in my time over the team. So there's three guys out there, three chefs. That's amazing. Who's, whose restaurant on their diploma is a cycling team. Well, that, that, I, pretty- I, I, that that's pretty cool. I mean, so that was the early days. Now, what yeah. I'd like to touch on um, as well is you you showed us the book you've got another book in the works which is basically 10 years on isn't it and and a lot has changed i mean yeah. i think we'd need a podcast of 5 hours to go into all that kind of detail yeah. uh, as we know <laughs> and also because you're an amazing talker but can you talk to me about the eat race win documentary that that you made which you can still watch can't you on on amazon and i remember yeah. being and you were with you moved on you stayed i know you stayed with tink uh, then evolved into the Tinkoff Saxo team, yeah. and that's when yeah. we, we met. And then you did a project with the uh, Orica Green Edge team um, yeah. at the at the Tour de France. Can you talk a little bit about that project? Because things had moved on. I, mm-hmm. I would imagine then you were working with nutritionists as well as coaches. So, and and the sport had evolved dramatically, and, and it still is, isn't it? That the, the pace of change is amazingly fast and rapid and and intriguing. But talk to me about that project. I mean, I think so. So the project sprung from uh, sprung from the 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 English version of that book coming out. Yeah. Um, it, it was, you know, um, it came for for my sake. It came out of the blue. Uh, I woke up one morning and I had uh, a message in any inbox possible: Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, email, you name it, from the same guy who uh, just said, "I'm a producer." Uh, I want to get in touch with you regarding a TV show based on your book. Please get in touch. And I'm like, prank. Who's pranking me here? Um, it turned out not to be a prank. And uh, back then when he contacted me, it was in six, 16, where I had the team, the Tinkoff team. I had to, if 
basically closed down in 16. I was not on the, I was not with them for the last year. Um, they're sort of like uh, finances was a little bit different. Um, so uh, I did a lot of freelancing stuff in 16. Uh, I worked with back then Dimension Data, helped them set up with their new chef. And that's when I did some stuff with you and Bora as yep. well. Uh, and they contacted me and they're like, we want to do a show with you uh, at the tour based on what you've done. And I'm like, that sounds great, but there's no team. I'm yeah, like, sure. the team doesn't exist anymore. You know, uh, so if we have to do it, we have to find a team to, to you know, basically connect to. And so uh, crazy, crazy hunt started uh, trying to find a team where I could basically just clip in. Um, and as I, I just explained, you know, gaining the trust of the riders is not something you do overnight. Yeah. Yeah. So it was it was it was a it was a difficult task to find a team that had sort of the same spirit as I felt like we had in the team. You know, I couldn't just take any team. As you uh, know, Italian and French teams are very classic and old school, and there's you know very different ways of doing things. So sure. you know, we landed on uh, Orica Greenwich, and luckily they were you know they saw that this could be a good potential for them as well. And um, and so we started working with them, um, basically trying to like, uh, I, I would go to races uh, just before the tour leading up to get to know them. And obviously then the riders are not the same at the tour as all the races. So, but you know, it was trying to, try, as, as, as fast as humanly possible, trying to like merge into the team. And um, so we did uh, a full race of Dauphiné with them before we uh, basically dropped in with uh, 30 people uh, of a television crew that had never, ever been to the tour um, before. Uh, and they all sort of, I felt like, had my name tag on them. It was like, I'm brought by Hannah Grant. And this was, as you might know, uh, a huge frustration for a lot of people in the cycling world when you bring in people that doesn't understand all the, the unspoken yeah, yeah. rules. And uh, where are you? When do you leave? Like all these things. And we had to have cameras in the cars and in the bus. And, you know, it was it was a crazy, crazy project. But um, we uh, filmed uh, at the Tour de France in 17. Um, miraculously managed to get through this whole thing. Everybody got fed. Uh, we won the white jersey. And, um, you know, it was it was obviously it was it was an interesting experience because um, it was impossible for me to do my job as I was normally supposed to do because I was expected to do so much other stuff. So you, you, know, were, I, you were essentially it, presenting as well, weren't you? And explaining rather than just doing the job, you're having to present yeah, um, as well. So exactly. And, and doubling the, I remember speaking to you and you, you weren't, I wouldn't say you were stressed, but you were clearly under, you were, Mind everybody around you but you were having to deliver and you were being filmed all the time so there's almost doubling the workload of making the food for the riders and actually being a presenter and that's uh, I, I mean and yeah. I and I had obviously I, I had uh, I had a team of three chefs come down and help me because it was impossible to do the logistics and shop and constantly be on and then uh, you know the producer would oh we gotta go sauce some beautiful strawberries here and I'm like my internal like cycling <laughs> chef was freaking out because I'm like, if I go there, spend two hours there, I'm going to be, you know, the timing is so important. So it was, it was the old school uh, cycling chef Hannah in in a complete clash battle with uh, the actual what we're doing here. I knew I had, I brought uh, one of my old apprentices who was a trained chef because then I knew he had done the whole charade before. He knew everything. He could get I on had. with it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, and and that that helped a lot. But it was still, you know, it was a, it was a crazy experience. But the and, show was amazing, and and it you know it tells a story about the sort of like. And that's the book. So the, so, so this yeah. is the it, it so basically as as well as cycling, the endurance athletes um, cookbook, and that's what it's all about, isn't it? It's I get could you, taking what you've learned actually, and people watching this 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 video this this video pod. Um, what bit of advice would you give to, I mean, because we've had conversation, we've recently had a conversation because um, you're going to produce another book, which we just talked about. But based on your learnings and your understanding of the beauty of food, the romance of food, sometimes the very traditional nature of cycling, although things have enormously changed. And 
And it's great to see that you're going to be dipping your toe back into the sport again and speaking to riders to gather their thoughts on the way yeah. of the last decade, really, since mm-hmm. since you became involved in cycling. Um, what? G- give me a few tips that you'd give to somebody watching this video who who wants to fuel right, okay, um, and and they're they're looking to just get better. What are the what are the fundamental tenants and elements of, of getting your fueling right, given what you've learned over the last few years? I think the, the main thing is definitely depending on where you are and how much you already know about nutrition. I mean, if you're starting out and you, you, you know, you're just dipping your toes into to cycling and nutrition, um, the number one thing is to, you know, don't overdo it at once to begin with. Don't think that you start day one uh, eating after a strict diet, measuring everything, going like completely, you know, uh, uh, into detail with everything, because um, that's not a sustainable way uh, to, to to enter that world. My uh, advice um, and what I say, you know, I, I frequently talk to writers about this also, you know, my advice is to do one step at a time. So you look at where your nutrition is right now. You know, if you're, a, uh, you know, if you're, um, uh, going to the pub uh, every day after work, having pints, but you also want to cycle, but it's a little bit hot going uphill. You know, the first place you start is saying, okay, um, I need to cut off the pints like Monday to Friday and then say, okay, maybe sometimes in the weekend. So you figure it out there. You know, this is this is going to help you dramatically improve performance. And then the next step, if you're already there where you're like, okay, I understand that, you know, treating myself, having a few pints or a nice dinner is, is uh, you know, uh, is great. But I want to sort of take it to the next step. And you're maybe riding a little bit more seriously. You want to look at timing of your meals. You want to look at recovery, uh, recovery meals as being, you know, the protein intake is extremely important uh, due to your basically the building of your muscle, which in the end is the power that you can, you know, perform with. So um, the more muscle mass you have, uh, the more calories you burn, the leaner you'll get eventually. So I think that is the next step is looking at protein intake in terms of timing and then thinking, you know, nowadays everybody fuels so much on the bike. Um, Typically, uh, on, a, on an easy training ride, you'd be around 60 uh, grams of carbs per hour, maybe 60 to 90. If you're most, you know, if you're training harder, you go 90 to maybe even up to 120 if it's really, really crazy. But this takes a lot of practice. Um, but definitely uh, never forget to eat whilst you're on the bike. That is yeah. so unbelievably important. Yeah. And then there's, you know... Um, Basically sitting down, figuring out my training route is three hours. I'm going to go, you know, more or less this pace. I'm going to burn this much. Calculate how much you're going to go through so you know how much to bring. Bring a little bit extra because you don't know if your, you know, trip's going to be longer. But the most important thing with this is then when you get back, you really must remember that you've already fueled to cover your needs in that, you know, training session. Don't overeat after you ride your dinner is not like this you're not riding a tour de france with like 21 stages so that is i think this is the most common mistake for a lot of people is they're like oh i'm training so hard and i'm eating on the bike and this and i get back and then i need "Mm, i need a huge portion um because you know that's not going to help you get lean and more fit is that i think that's that's sort of like the thing um so baby steps and then basic thing um Educate yourself within macronutrients. Learn about carbs, fat, and protein. Um, sure. What do they do? What do they? When you know the timing of them. When should, when should you eat what? Um, and then play around with you know uh, different types of things for you because what works for the world's best sprinter might not work for you. Sure. You know we're all we're all different. So okay. Um, and then base rule: never try anything crazy and new the day before an important uh, race. I mean, yeah. don't, I think, don't I think start that, a new uh, diet. <laughs> I think that is a, a, an enormously, it's quite a simple tip, but it's enormously important. And I think many people, especially people who are relatively new, might yeah. do that. Um, not uh, because, Even because pro the, riders will do that, Matt. I tell yeah, you yeah. that. It's absurd. <laughs> They're like, I want to start this diet now. I'm like, 
no 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 yeah well yeah. well hannah it's we're, we're running out of time it's been first and foremost it's been lovely to catch up with you thanks for being so generous with your time it's been enormously interesting trying to condense down um, a lifetime of working within food and and, and, and latterly within the cycling industry and, and your journey through it um where can people watch eat race win because it's still available to i was actually watching it earlier on where can people still watch that so uh, it's on Amazon Prime, uh, okay. and as I normally say, there's if you're not signed up, I'm sure you can just sign up for free for seven days, and you can crack the seven, uh, six episodes. Yeah, okay. uh, and uh, if you're interested in the books, you can get them on my website, hannahgrant.com. And uh, Matt, there's a pre-order on the new book, which is going to be the Grand Tour Cookbook too. And and I'm gonna I'm gonna have a little paragraph in there as well, aren't I? So uh, which I'm very very excited Definitely. about. Well, 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 Hannah, thanks very much, and you take care of yourself, and I hope Thank that you. we will catch up on the road uh, over a beer and some nice food sooner rather than later. Thanks very much. Thank you.